Welcome to the Maple Money Show, the podcast that helps Canadians improve their personal finances to create lasting financial freedom. Are you new to investing? Maybe you have a couple mutual funds from your bank or haven't started at all. Then stay tuned to today's episode as John Robertson will take us through how to get started and make the most of your money. John is a great source for those looking to get started with investing. He's the blogger behind Blessed by the Potato at HolyPotato.net and wrote the book, The Value is Simple, and he created a course by the same name. Summer is moving season. Get your credit score and report for free from Borowell to give to your new landlord. Borowell offers the Equifax Risk Score 2.0 credit score. It's a popular score that's used by many banks and lenders. It's a legitimate and free option to give to your realtor or landlord. You can find out more at maplemoney.com slash borrowwell. That's maplemoney.com slash B-O-R-R-O-W-E-L-L. Now, let's talk investing with John. Hi, John. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me out. Um, so I wanted to talk with you. Uh, I, I know you have a, a, your site and your course and everything around investing. So, so I wanted to go right to the beginning. If if I were a, a beginner investor, sort of, what's the the first step I need to take to to actually get into this whole investing thing? Well, it depends on whether you want to take a good first step or just the most essential first step. Because the most essential first step is you got to take some money and buy an investment. But of course, before you do that, you got to create an an account. Mm -hmm. But before you do that, you really should create a plan because it's the plan that's going to help guide everything. It's going to help you get through those rough patches in the market that are inevitably going to come up and help remind you, like, why am I doing this investing thing? Because investing feels awesome when the markets are going up and when your investment's doing better. But when markets crash and you're losing money, it feels really bad. And you go like, why am I doing this really dumb thing where I'm losing money? And you got to go back to your plan and and that'll help uh, set you straight. So step one really is planning. Okay. Um, so what does that look like? Like uh, when I first started investing, I mentioned this on, on my show already, is uh, I just hopped into a mutual fund. Um, uh, my idea of planning back then was just look at past results, and that one looked good. <laughs> so that, that's what I ended up going with. Yeah, so that's what I was sort of hinting at before, which is <laughs> that's the essential step. Like that gets you there, but then it's not the ideal way to start. So planning is really thinking about, you know, in broad strokes, what are you saving for? Why are you doing this? To help remind you of why you're doing it in the first place. And also getting an, an idea of what risk is, because investing is going to involve risk. Uh, we can't escape that. And it's a real disservice to not sort of address it up front. So, you know, are you comfortable with this money being locked up for a period of time? Because you don't want to be investing money that you're going to need next month for groceries. So that's part of where the plan is going to come in. Is this money for retirement? Is it for your car to be replaced in five to 10 years? Or is it for groceries or rent next month? And so that's where the plan is really going to help identify that first element of your risk tolerance is how long do you have before you need this money again? Because different investments are going to have risks coming in on different timescales. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk about those types of investments then. Uh, sort of what can people invest in beyond just that that mutual fund, like I explained? <laughs> um, and, and, and how does that sort of affect the risk? So there's different ways of getting these different kinds of investments, but under the hood, you're going to have stocks and bonds and things like cash or cash equivalents, like savings accounts, basically. Mm -hmm. And so the stocks part are going to be more risky in the short term compared to the bond part. The bond part is generally more safe, especially when you're talking about government bonds, where you have some sort of guarantee that you're going to get some uh, given rate of return, some interest payment that the bond's going to pay and some maturity date where you're going to get your money back from the individual bond. Then you bundle a whole bunch of those up together into a mutual fund or ETF or whatever, which we can get into later. Uh, The stocks are going to be more risky in the short term because the stock market goes up and down as people are willing to pay more or less for each of the stocks. And again, you'll bundle a whole bunch of stocks together under the hood of whatever thing you're actually going to go out and purchase, mutual fund, ETF, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, But those stocks can go up and down in the short term. But over the long term, those are actually your better bet for beating other kinds of risks like inflation. So if you need to support yourself for retirement 30 years from now, you probably want to have some stocks. But if you want to pay for a car in five years, you probably don't want very much of your money in stocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I think everybody sort of thinks they they can handle that risk until until we see these dips that that we've had a a few times in their yeah. in their recent past, and and then you re- really start to see uh, what what you can handle. Yeah, um, it's it's very easy to um, think that you can handle the risks uh, because on a chart the risks look very simple. Like, oh, it goes down and it goes back up. And because generally you're investing after some long period of the market having gone up, especially if you look over the very long term, like 30, 40, 50 years, well, the market goes up and there's dips, but it goes back up. But a dip on a chart that might be a couple of years looks like a little blip on the chart. A couple of years is a long time to live through it in real time. Yeah, especially with really bad timing. Like I I, I was lucky enough that... um I always seem to get in and out of things <laughs> just as the dips were were about to happen. Um, not from any kind of trying to time the market. Like one time I took money out for a home buyer's plan and uh, that was, that was uh, late 2008. So, so the market still went down quite a bit and, and that's what got me out of the mutual funds. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I get that, that, that someone doesn't necessarily want to take that risk uh, or, or they might think they do, but they won't when it actually happens. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned things like, uh, stocks and bonds. Um, a, a question I've been asked a lot lately is, is what, what kind of, uh, what, what's my opinion on, on investing in Bitcoin? Um, I, I'd also lump gold in with that. Just any of this kind of more alternative stuff compared to, to the straight numbers that we're talking about. I mean, we can go and try to have opinions on all these things. I don't think it's necessary to have an opinion on this sort of stuff. I mean, I have one, I can talk about it, (laughs) but really if you're a beginning investor, if you're just trying to get your money to work for you to work towards retirement, I mean, there's a reason we call these alternative investments is because they're alternatives to the mainline investments of stocks and bonds. And as long as you're globally diversified with your stocks uh, and you have a good mix of stocks and bonds, I mean, that's going to carry you over the finish line to retirement. You don't need to make it any more complex. Uh, So, I mean, I don't really think that they're necessary. And if you want to do some research on them, I mean, go ahead, but I don't talk about them very much in uh, what I do. And and I don't really believe that they're necessary. Yeah, I I totally agree. (laughs) Um, So so you kind of just alluded to uh, sort of how, how to make your portfolio uh, what, what would you say the simplest way to do that is? Uh, you had mentioned ETFs before. Is, is that sort of what you recommend or are there other options that, that are, are pretty decent? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of uh, good options uh, that are out there and it really depends on, so we haven't mentioned fees at all yet. Mm-hmm. And so really you want to be minimizing your fees as much as possible within your capacity to still maintain your plan because ETFs are the cheapest way to invest. So lots of people love them, especially financial bloggers such as you and me, because they're super cheap and super diversified. So you can just go out, buy a couple of ETFs, have this really diversified portfolio, really cheap fees, which is you know one measure of success. And because we're really into this stuff, ETFs don't phase us at all. They're not at all daunting. But if you're a newer investor, you might find a brokerage account and ETFs a little bit more cumbersome to deal with, in which case some other options might include mutual funds that include stocks and bonds, including the very simplest, in my opinion, is either a robo-advisor, which will do all of the purchases of ETFs for you, or something like Tangerine's all-in-one mutual funds, where it's just one thing that you got to go and buy. And Tangerine makes it super easy because you don't even have to like buy the mutual fund, it works almost exactly the same as throwing money into your savings account. You just put the money into the account, they buy the mutual fund units for you, and then you have your money invested. So it can be just that simple, but of course that's going to cost a little bit more than doing it yourself with ETFs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm mostly ETFs right now. Uh, I have considered going to robo advisors though. Um, I, I know there's an extra fee, but, but just like a lot of things in my life, if, if I can kind of get it off my plate and allows me to do something else with, with my time. Um, originally things like, yeah, rebalancing and, uh, and all that was kind of exciting. It, it, it got less exciting over the years. <laughs> uh, but, but for now, yes, I am still in ETFs. Uh, and, and before that I had the, the uh, TDE series, which is, uh, I, I remember it being a hard way to sign up. <laughs> yeah. But uh, once you got them, it was it was pretty uh, simple way to invest. 
Yeah, and then that's the perfect summary of the TDE series. They're <laughs> a bit of a pain to sign up for. They make you go through a lot of hoops and uh, do some non-intuitive things to get the account yeah. going in the first place. But once you have it, you can automate a lot of things and it runs really easily. And they are the cheapest mutual funds available um, with a small amount of money to put in in the first place. So um, they're a great alternative to ETFs and a lot of people recommend them. Yeah, for sure. Um, and speaking of signing up, going the other direction, back to the the robo advisors, uh, you, you can sign up in a, a couple minutes, I think, uh, on your cell phone with some of these. Yeah. <laughs> um. So we we kind of talked a bit about about risk. If uh, maybe uh, you can go into a little bit about how people's own psychology can kind of mess with them. Uh, one thing I've talked about often is uh, sort of the confirmation bias. If you want to go into that or any anything else around around the psychology of investing, because I think the reason I'm pro ETF more than the fees is a lot of other investments, if you're just investing in stocks, people can get in their own way a lot. Yeah. <laughs> just going all in on one stock or, or and then freaking out when it drops. But uh, if, if you just want to touch on sort of the psychology of investing a bit. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a big part to being successful in the long term. Uh, you know, you talk about getting in your own way. That's very easy to do if you try to make your portfolio too complicated. If you say, well, instead of just buying this one all market fund, I'm going to break it up into its 12 constituent components and tweak each of the asset allocations in my own special formula to get my own special return <laughs> that I love. And then five years later, like, what was I thinking? What? How? What? <laughs> and so it becomes really complicated to manage and you get into uh, what I like to call execution risk, which is, you know, you're not adding extra market risk, but you're adding the risk that you're going to screw something up in trying to rebalance and manage and make your purchases when you make your stuff too complex. And it's very easy because in a lot of other aspects of life and a lot of other of our consumer purchases, having more complicated things, more options is the better way to go. It sounds awesome. It makes <laughs> us more prestigious. It makes our technology do more things when it has more options and more bells and whistles. And in investing, you don't really want all those bells and whistles because it just opens up more room for you to make a mistake. Just try to get invested, stay with it for the long term, save as much as you can. Those are the things that are going to make you successful. Not all of the extra little loops and complications and twists and turns that you try to put into it. And in fact, those will make you more likely to get into your own way and uh, make some sort of unintended mistake that will cost you perhaps more than you ever could have made if you successfully pulled off your strategy. Yeah. Um, speaking of getting in your own way, <laughs> the... Uh... Uh, another one that, that I've heard before is, is people that are interested in, in day trading. Like they, they want to, they want to go in and out of different stocks literally every day. Uh, I, I know there's lots of success stories and everything like that, but, uh, I assume that's probably not a good way for anyone to go. Yeah. Day trading. I mean, coming back to your comment about confirmation bias, day trading can be very dangerous if you try it and you're good at it for the first couple of weeks. Because then you're like, well, I'm good at it. And then you have a bad couple of weeks and you're like, but I was good at it before. <laughs> and now I just have this one little problem and then I'll fix it and I'll be good at it again. I'll make all kinds of money. And then it just ends up in disaster because day trading is extremely hard. And it, sounds good on the upside because the upside is that you make a whole bunch more than a buy and hold investor because you're getting all of this like extra return every single day. I yeah. can actually pull that off. But the downside is that you can lose that much more return every single day. And lots of day traders do end up underperforming the market or even going like completely bust if they're bad at it and don't get out of it in time. So yeah. some people can pull it off, but for most people, especially if you're a novice investor, and you're just trying to figure out some way to get your money invested to get going toward retirement. I mean, you don't need to get into day trading and it's kind of dangerous to try. Yeah. Um, I don't like comparing investing to gambling, but when when you describe that, <laughs> it sounded like someone that does well in a casino for half a night. Yeah. And then the other half of the night, they lose it all. So Yeah. And, and so comparing investing to gambling is is, uh, you know, it's something that happens a lot because some people will say, oh, this is a good bet. And that turns some people off because they're like, oh, investing is really just gambling because there's uncertainties and there's probabilities and there's math. And so because 
investing and gambling do share some of the same probability based math and um, returns of that nature and, and uncertainty, it can turn people off of investing. But long term investing is really not the same as gambling because you expect over the long term that your investments are going to grow and you're going to come out ahead. Whereas in gambling, you expect if you keep at it long enough, the house is going to win, not you. <laughs> and day trading comes much closer to gambling than mm-hmm. long term investing does. Yeah, yeah, it really sounded like it there. Uh, now, now another thing that I think, if, if someone's a beginner investor, that this is something that can throw them off is where do they invest uh, tax shelter wise? Like uh, they they know they can invest in an RSP. They they know about TFSAs. Maybe putting it in none of that. Um, then again, some people might think an RSP is an actual investment itself. Uh, can, can you just I'll go down to the bank to buy my RSPs? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, can you kind of go into sort of your your thoughts on which one's best and where people should be investing? Uh, yeah, so they both have their pros and cons, and they're very complementary to each other, TFSAs and RSPs. Uh, then you have your other options like your RESPs, Registered Education Savings Plans, for those with uh, kids. Then you can save towards their education and get a government grant. And then the you know, sort of definition by exclusion, the non-registered account, which is your taxable account. So if you've used up all of your tax favored space, your TFSAs, RSPs, and if you have kids, RESPs, uh, then you end up investing by default in a taxable account and you have to deal with all those taxes. So I love TFSAs because they're very simple. You put money in, it grows tax-free, you take it out tax-free. RSPs are a little bit more complicated because you put pre-tax money in. So that means that you put money that hasn't been taxed yet in, or because most of us get a paycheck that has already had tax taken off, you put money in that's had tax taken off, you get a tax refund, and then you can put that in too. And then the money grows tax-free. And then when you withdraw, those withdrawals are taxed. And there might be a difference at the rate that you're putting the money in, in terms of the tax rate that you're hitting versus when you're taking it out, the tax rate you might be at if your overall income level drops between when you're working and contributing and when you're retired and pulling money out of the RSP. Of course, sometimes it can go the other way. Uh, So I have a very simple rule of thumb, which is put the money in your TFSA first, because the RSP tends to work out better for people who are in higher income brackets, who have which generally means that they have more money to invest in the first place. So they'll probably just fill that TFSA anyway, and it'll be somewhat meaningless, like not totally meaningless, but a smaller portion of their overall investments compared to their RSP. So they'll fill the TFSA, then move into their RSP. Um, Whereas those who are in lower income levels, probably the TFSA is going to be better for them anyway. So they'll start contributing to the TFSA and they might just barely fill that as part of their retirement planning. And then that'll be it. Um, and, and that's just a general quick rule of thumb. If you need somewhere to start from, I think it's a pretty good one, but yep. no, as like always, that. uh, you, you got to personalize it yourself. You got to go through your own plan, maybe work it out with a planner as to what's best for your situation. Uh, but it, you can't go too far wrong with TFSA first. Yeah. I like that. Cause you're right. If, if, if you're a beginner investor, most of the time, you're probably also going to be lower income, uh, because you're, you're younger, you're starting out. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's also reversible because the TFSA is super flexible. You can take money out um, tax free and you get the contribution room back the following calendar year. So, if you start out investing everything in your TFSA because you're just like, start, like, I'm, I'm just going to get started. I'm going to invest. I'm going to do it in my TFSA. I'm going to figure out my detailed plan later. A couple of years later, you finally figure out the detailed plan. You're like, oh, the RSP is actually better for my situation. You take the money out of the TFSA and start moving it into the RSP at that point. Whereas if you start the other way around, putting the money in the RSP first, you can't then take it out and put it in the TFSA without some tax consequences. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so there's no going back. And you lose the room forever. Yeah. Um, it kind of uh, as a little s- side note, I guess, is um, what's your thoughts on on peer-to-peer lending the, the only one i know of here in canada is is lending loop now like where you, where you can invest in a in a business kind of directly as as a loan um what are your thoughts on that uh and and, and sort of where do you maybe see it going in the in the future um i've been impressed at how well they have been doing i was extremely skeptical when these first came out i was like they're gonna blow up yeah, because <laughs> you don't go to a peer-to-peer lender to try to get a loan unless either you're 
able to get a much better interest rate from the people that are crowdfunding this than you could get from the bank. And the interest rates did not look particularly good for the borrower because mm-hmm. they were offering decent returns for the people investing. Uh, so I was like, they got to be bad credit risks. This is just going to be terrible. But it, it, so far, it's been okay. Uh, but we also haven't had a full sort of economic cycle since peer-to-peer lending was invented. Like most of these came out after 2008, 2009. So when the next recession comes, I don't know how those loans are going to perform. That's something that people need to think about. Uh, And I also don't know how much insight you can really get into the lenders that you're uh, providing those loans to. Because again, this is now, you're doing active investing now. This isn't like a peer-to-peer lending ETF that you're just adding to your uh, portfolio. So I, I would caution people to keep those in mind that there may be some risks there that are unknowable at this point. So yeah. maybe they'll do continue to do fine forever. I don't know. Yeah, I, I like that because just just like in 2008, 2009, businesses fail <laughs> during, during recessions like that. Um, so yeah, it, it, when they have that loan for a new truck or to re- renovate their restaurant, it, it, none of it's going to matter if, if that business falls apart. Um, I, I've been liking it so far. The reason I brought it up is I, I just looked recently. I'd put a small amount of money in and almost a year later, it's it's 18% before their fees. I think that makes it maybe about 16%, maybe it's 16 and a half, um, which surprised me. <laughs> I, was, I was pretty happy with that. Uh, but yeah, like right now, everybody's paying their, paying their debt. So it's, <laughs> it's been good for me. Yeah, but again, someone's paying 18%, like, you can get credit cards for that <laughs> for even less in some cases. That's a good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. So who's, who's getting that loan at that rate? Yeah. That's, that's because some of them are rated off the top of my head. I think um, it's like an E rating it might give you 23% or something like that. So, so of course I've been ringing that bell for like six years now and <laughs> I've been wrong. So I'll admit it. I've, I've been very cautious on this and, I seem to be overly paranoid about it, but yeah. Yeah. It's a, I, I don't know. I was surprised too. Like I, I, I put a little in just to try out the service and um, now, now I'm considering maybe doing some more, but <laughs> um, so sort of just to bring it back to the, the beginning, if, if someone's decided that they want to invest, what, what should they do? Like uh, you mentioned Tangerine, if they wanted that one fund, we mentioned TD as well. What if they just want to buy the ETFs or or go with a robo advisor? Do you have a, a few companies you can sort of shout out where people might be able to look? Uh, there are a ton of robo advisors and, um, you know, you can go to the autoinvest.ca calculator that's now run by Kyle Prevo and uh, Justin Bouchard, uh, the guys behind Young and Thrifty. Um, and that will help compare the different options for you. So like things like Nest Wealth have a flat fee. So that works out better for people with lots of money to invest. Whereas things like Just Wealth and Wealth Simple and Wealth Bar and you know I'm <laughs> missing a whole bunch of others because there's like nine or ten of them now. Yeah. Um and RBC is coming out with one soon. Um that looks kind of exciting too. So I mean like there's tons of options out there. Um it's it's tough to really pick a winner, especially when there's so much uh, other stuff hanging around them that can help differentiate them as to which one may or may not be better for you. Yeah. Um, but the, signing up with those is quite easy. And if you want to buy ETFs, then uh, a brokerage account is what you need because ETFs are sold over the stock exchange. And so you need a brokerage account to get access to that. Uh, and the one that is sort of, consistently recommended by people such as myself and other bloggers is uh, quest trade because they offer nearly free to buy etfs um, for pretty much any etf there's other ones that offer free to buy etfs and even free to buy and sell etfs but there's usually some sort of restriction on there like either you have to buy in multiples of 100 shares Oh yeah, uh, I think the case at National Bank, or they offer a very limited menu of ETFs that are on their free to buy uh, menu, which is the case at Scotia I Trade. Okay, um, yeah, I'm. And otherwise, I'm, you I'm, a, I'm a fan of Quest Trade as well. I've actually got all four of those accounts we were talking about: the RSP, TFSA, RESP, and the and the non-registered. Um, so yeah. <laughs> 
And and I did move over there. I mentioned this in the past episode already, but I did move over there from TDE series once they started doing that, uh, the no commission on, on ETFs that, that, that made the decision a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so before we go, uh, I, Last time I saw you, we were we were doing karaoke. So when you're not in a when you're not in a karaoke bar, where can people find you online? Uh, so I've got a blog. It's uh, called Blessed by the Potato at HolyPotato.net. It's been running for a long time. It covers a lot of topics, but most of the last ten years or so of material has really been focused on personal finance and investing. I have a book. It's called The Value of Simple. And it is a step-by-step guide to how to get started with investing from setting up your account to making the trades to how to track things for taxes and uh, how to decide between your TFSA RSP and to come up with a really simple sort of three-page plan that will help keep you on track. And then after I wrote the book, I got a whole bunch of questions from people about how to invest, how to do this in more depth and in more media than just a book. So, you know, they want to hear my voice, they want to see videos. So I put together an online course you can take at your own pace. It's at course.valuesimple.ca and the book is at valuesimple.ca. Nice. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me out, Tom. Thanks to John Robertson for the pointers for new investors. You can find show notes for this episode at maplemoney.com slash John Robertson. The Maple Money Show is still new and I'd love your help in growing the audience so more people can get weekly ideas on how to make, save, invest, and spend money. Could you do me a huge favor and share maplemoney.com slash show with a friend or family member who wants to improve their finances? Thanks, and I look forward to having you back next week. Mm -hmm.